Real quick before the show, I wanted to let you know that our next episode, number 485, will be up a couple of days late. Instead of publishing on Sunday right before the WWC keynote, David and I instead are going to record that episode in person after Apple's announcements, and we should have it out on Tuesday, June 4th. Now, on with the show. Mac Power Users episode 484. Unlocking Keyboard Maestro. Hello and welcome back to Mac Power Users. I am your host, Stephen Hackett, and I am joined, as always, by my friend and yours, Mr. David Sparks. Hello, Stephen. Ready for another episode of Mac Power Users. Yeah, and this one's going to be a, a lot of fun. Keyboard Maestro is one of those applications in the Mac world where I think a lot of people have heard about it, but I think it it kind of has a reputation for being a little intimidating, and we're going we're gonna to get deep into it today and, and help people... Not only get started, but take it places that never thought they could. Amen, brother. Amen. It's good. It's good. Um, And of course, this is in conjunction with your new field guide, which we're going to talk about in a second. But before we get to all that, I just wanted to mention very briefly, because we've been talking about it in the forums for months now, but there is a new toggle client for iOS called Timery. Toggle is a time tracking service. So if you're like me and track your time every day. Uh, it's, it's a very popular service, but its iOS app is it's not very good. And Timer is a new third-party application that's spectacular. I've got some links in the show notes to a review that I wrote, a review that John Voorhees wrote over on Mac Stories. If you are time tracking with Toggle, this app makes it way better on iOS. It's, it's really nicely integrated with things like widgets and Siri support. So anyways, we've talked about it a lot in the forums. It's been in beta for a really long time, and it's finally out. So I just wanted to point people that direction if that's something that they are interested in. Yeah, I'm not currently time tracking, but when I was at, during this beta period, this app runs circles around anything that Toggle has released. Oh, yeah. It's just it's just crazy. And this is one of those weird apps that we've been talking about on podcasts now for months. It's like the old days with Workflow when Workflow was before it got released. Everybody mm-hmm. talked about it. Nobody could get it. Now yeah. you can get it. So if you want to do time tracking, this is a good one. Absolutely. Uh, but as promised, we're here to talk about keyboard maestro and uh, tell us a little bit about the field guide because this outline today just to pull the curtain back a little bit is i took the field guide keyboard maestro is one of those apps that i used a long time ago but i haven't used in years uh, honestly and it was an app that i I basically had forgotten the ins and outs of it so i went through the field guide and learned a whole bunch so tell us maybe a little bit about the field guide and and we'll come back to this at the end and talk about some of the prep and and feelings and stuff but uh what's the story here I actually said this in the field guide, you know, the thing about keyboard maestro that I think is overwhelming for people is just how much it can do. You know, you look at an app like text expander, it expands text. Hazel manages your files for you, but keyboard maestro does everything. I mean, we're going to talk as you listen to this show, you'll hear all the different triggers and actions this application can use. And you you literally can do just about anything that a human can do on a Mac it, with a keyboard master script, you can move and click the mouse, you can, uh, you know, we'll, we'll get into it. But it does so much that I think for a lot of people, it's overwhelming. Now, the story I told in the field guide was what would happen if someone gave you a, a little Lego set with instructions and then you'd be able to build your Lego. But what if someone took all the Legos in the... Le- I said it wrong, Stephen. I said Legos. Uh, oh, no. Here they come. What if someone took all the Lego in the Lego store and they dumped it on your desk? All of it. No instructions. And then you might freak out. And that's, I think, a little bit of the experience some people have with Keyboard Maestro because there's just so much you can do with this application it's almost paralyzing. I've been working on this field guide for, for really years. I, I started the outline three years ago, and uh, but I've been in active production on it for six months. And I really, that was the hard part for this one for me, was getting the right balance to, to help people who've never used it before, but also give stuff to people that, that have used it before. And uh, I just got an email from TJ Luoma, who's one of the uh, keyboard maestro pros I know. And he he learned some things in it, which made me feel good. That was, the, that was like my test. Um, but the, uh, either way, uh, it's, it's really great. It's, uh, 76 videos, four plus hours of content, all closed captioned and transcribed. It's soup to nuts on keyboard maestro. And it starts from the very beginning, how to install the app and gets you through some pretty advanced concepts by the end. And you can get it over at learn.maxsparky. 
Um, like other field guides, uh, I do the thing that everybody tells me is wrong. I put it on discount at the beginning. <laughs> I, every, every time I do this, I get emails from people saying, don't you understand marketing? But uh, the people that have been loyal to me all these years and bought my stuff, I want them to get the best price. So it's $24 for a week or two, and then it's going to go up to tw- 29 So if you want to get in there, get it. And, uh, and we're going to talk about a lot of the stuff during the show today, but I'm really proud of the way the field guide came out. It's all, you know, it's all video learning and, uh, with, with some random appearances of me once in a while. (laughs) A lot of automation is surprisingly visual. If you're new to it, you know, automator, keyboard maestro shortcuts, you're kind of building with building blocks to, to stretch your analogy from a second ago. Yeah. And, and seeing it is, uh, seeing it is helpful. And so I think that's a great way to do it as opposed to just, I mean, look, I would watch you on screen for six hours or eight hours, however long it takes, but seeing the app is probably more helpful in the end of the day. You mean, wouldn't it, you wouldn't want me to just see my face saying, and then the mouse is going to move and click the box. Whoa, that was awesome. I wish you could have seen it. <laughs> yeah. You're, you're there watching a movie and just, you know, just talking about, you know, uh, so, so go check it out. That link is in the show notes. There's also a link, obviously, to Keyboard Maestro itself and it is up to version eight it's 36 bucks for a new license it's discounted if you have an older uh, version but there is a uh, there's a discount for mpu listeners is that right yeah uh peter the guy behind keyboard maestro field guide uh, that was the other one he likes the field guide he got early access to it and it was like if you made a movie about star wars you'd want george lucas to like it right so uh peter liked it and i said well great can we translate that like to some love for our listeners? And he said, sure. So if you use the offer code KMFG, as in Keyboard Maestro Field Guide, you get 20% off the app. So if you're listening and you don't have the app yet, not only can we get you a discount on the guide, we can get you a discount on the app as well. Awesome. And I have that noted in the show notes as well. So great. Uh, if you're driving and want to do that later, it's in the show notes. Yeah. Got to look out for people. You know, people are driving around listening about Keyboard Maestro. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, so like we said, it's on version eight. I thought we could talk a little bit about Keyboard Maestro as sort of a, from like a really broad perspective before we start diving into it piece by piece. Uh, it's been around a long time. Version eight is the newest version, but it's been on the Mac basically as long as I can remember. It's one of those those apps that really, Keyboard Maestro like takes advantage of what makes the Mac special. And as a result, it is something distinctly Mac-like in and of itself with support for things like iMessage, touch bar support, multiple browsers. I mean, all the things you would expect to have at your fingertips, Keyboard Maestro delivers to you. Yeah, it's, it's you know, like some of the other apps that I love, it has, there's common traits. And one of the common traits is a single, very dedicated developer. I mean, this is an application that's not made by a big company like Microsoft. It's made by a small development house, I think largely one guy does most of the work and he's super passionate about it. So with every update, the app just adds a little bit more to the stack. And with Keyboard Maestro, it's a very big stack. So I I love, I love supporting small developers and I love how much power this gives me over the Mac. I, I feel like um, Siri shortcuts is great, but there's no way you're ever going to get the kind of automation on an iOS device, Apple's just never going to let you do what we can do with Keyboard Maestro on a Mac. Yeah. I mean, just listen to some of these features and think about them in an iOS context just for a second. Uh, clipboard history, you've already struck out there. Multiple clipboards. Cu- or cu- custom clipboards. You can just make a set of clipboards based on things that are important to you that are always there. For you. Mm-hmm. That, that That's distinctly Mac-like. Uh, like you said, automating mouse clicks, you know, t- automating the interface itself. One of the things that's cool about Keyboard Maestro is there are other programs out there for the Mac that offer like one or two of these features and they're the whole app. So like window manipulation is one of them. There are several menu bar apps on the Mac that let you resize windows in clever ways. But if you're already using Keyboard Maestro for other things, you can use it for this as well. It can resize, scale, minimize, all those things you would expect as just one part of like a, even a larger workflow if you want. And uh, in Keyboard Master's case, you can customize it even more. You can say this particular application always goes to this particular location. Mm-hmm. 
Um, it's it, it's nice once once you figure it figure it out, and, and that's fine. You know, that's why I made the guide honestly because I I made it for myself as well as anybody else. I wanted to make sure I could you know extract all the juicy goodness out of it, and <laughs> you got to really go through it to figure it out. Yeah, absolutely. Um, it's got some some other cool tricks. It can control media playback through iTunes. It can also uh, control QuickTime and some others. Those are like kind of surface level things. And then you get into like deep things. Like you can use tools like Apple Script, Automator, Shell Script, so you can run Perl, Python, Ruby. Basically, any any sort of programming or automation you can do in the command line, you can bring into a keyboard. Mas- keyboard maestro macro. That is a very tricky phrase and I'm going to mess up today. So forgive me in advance, but uh, you can pull them into macros where before you, you may have to go take a trip to terminal or someplace else. And now it can be together in an interface that, you know, you can combine these things. You can pause iTunes and then run a Ruby script all from a single shortcut. Although I do think that is one of the traps of keyboard maestro that, where people get scared off is they're like, well, I don't know how to Ruby script, so why would I need this app? Right. And I can I can tell you that my field guide is four hours, and very little of it is about scripting. Mm-hmm. I mean, just there's so many little problems you can have that are solvable with Keyboard Maestro with the built-in tools that oh, yeah. scripting is, is icing on the cake, really. Yeah, you could do hundreds of things in Keyboard Maestro and never touch that layer. Just like you can you can do things like in Text Expander or in Alfred, all these other tools – that offer UI control and like UI way, ways of doing things. The way I view it is these scripting languages and this stuff is just there if you want to go that deep. But I think to your point, you, you could run Keyboard Maestro for years and never worry about writing a shell script and get all the power in the world out of it. Those, those tools are just there for those who do need to go deeper or maybe they prefer to do things that way. But it can do... Yeah. Um, a lot of other things. So an example of this, thinking about thinking about over the last couple of episodes, I shared a problem I was having with doing relays banking stuff where I would copy, you know, dollar sign one comma two, three, four, and I would need to paste it somewhere without the dollar sign or without any formatting. And I had a tech soap job set up for this, but it was one of those things where I was really just using tech soap just for this. And I kind of wanted to have it in a more fluid way. And I ended up being able to do it with the help of a friend because I'm not uh, super into Ruby, but we were able to do it with a shell script in Text Expander. So now I just have an expansion that runs that script and puts, you know, replaces the clipboard for me. I could do that a bunch of different ways. TechSoup was a great way to do it that was visual, but you can do it this other way too if you need to go that far. And I think Keyboard Maestro does a really good job at giving you lots of visual ways of doing something. And then at the end of the day, if you need to go to the extra layer, it's there, but it's not the primary interaction. And the nice thing is you don't necessarily have to learn to script. If you search any problem, somebody on the internet has probably posted an existing script that you can at least use as a starting point. Absolutely. You can do uh, a couple other things. It has text expansion tools as well, like, like Tech Expander and others. Uh, but one thing that I really appreciated was you can actually sync your keyboard maestro I'm going to call it an environment because that's how it feels. All of the all of your macros and shortcuts and everything, you can sync that to other Macs. I have mine set up to sync via Dropbox. And so my MacBook Pro and my iMac Pro have all of the same macros set up on it. And if you, you know, if you ever use any of these tools and you're on more than one Mac, you want those to be the same everywhere. There's nothing worse than having one set of muscle memory shortcuts and on your desktop and then going to your notebook and they're not there. And so yeah. uh, Keyboard Maestro takes care of that. And the Dropbox Sync, in my experience, has been extremely reliable and something that I've, I'm have i really glad is there. Yeah, agreed. Agreed. It's just a really powerful application. It it takes automation to the next level. You know, I, I've said this on the show before, like, you know, Text Expander is the entry point. Hazel is like the next step. And then Keyboard Maestro is like the step on top of that. Mm-hmm. And as we go through this episode and talk about some of the keyword master scripts we've generated, you'll get the idea. So why did you want to, so you said you want to do this for yourself and for others, but did you, was there anything super surprising going through this process about keyboard maestro or about automation on the Mac that you hadn't thought about before? Uh, well, I always got new ideas for scripts. The more I spent time with it, I, um, as we're going to talk in this show, we're going to kind of index the various triggers and actions and we'll explain what that means shortly. 
Uh, but, you know, there are some triggers and actions that I knew were there, but I'd never really laid hands on them. And once I did start building some sample scripts, even just for the screencast, mm-hmm. suddenly ideas start triggering and I'm building totally. new ones. And, and, you know, it, and it's funny because now that I've cataloged all this keyboard maestro knowledge, I still have more. I mean, there'll be a 1.1 update already. I've already got three scripts I want to add to the 1.1, but, you know, at some point you got to ship it. You know? <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, uh, but, you know, so I'm adding new ones as I go. So, but it's just... um and that's the reason why I wanted to make the field guide. Honestly, you know, anytime I can help share some knowledge about using your Mac better, faster, more efficient, I love getting those emails from listeners and customers that say, oh, I got this thing that you did, and now I'm getting my work done faster. That, to me, is like the ultimate payoff. Mm-hmm. And, boy, there's not much more you can do to automate a Mac than, than Keyboard yeah. Maestro. So the, the the big problem was the challenge of it because it's so wide and far. Sure. You know, I'm sure um, getting your arms around it to the, you know, and deciding what goes in, what doesn't go in, and how to make it accessible to people who've not used it before, that's the trick. And uh, that's why it took me so long to get it put together. One thing I, I caught myself doing going through the course, you said it's what, four hours of content? Yeah. It took me a lot longer than that just because I would watch you do something and I would have an idea about, oh, like this example set off an idea of something that I'm doing manually all the time. Or maybe I'm doing an Alfred or Text Expander and be done better in Keyboard Maestro. And so I find myself pausing the video and going to Keyboard Maestro and trying something and getting something built and then going back. And I think yeah. that's the way to do this is to have, you know, Safari on one side and Keyboard Maestro on the other a, so you can build the examples as you go through it. But my guess is that people will have ideas for new things even before they're done with the course. Because once you sort of see some of the things it can do, for me at least, it really opened my eyes to some other things I could do. And I've got a couple of those I'm going to share at the end of the show. But it's, uh, it's it was kind of cool going through it and like building things as I was going. I feel like one of the best ways to solve or learn automation is to solve a specific problem you have. So if it's trigger something while you're going through the course and you stop and build a script for it, then that's great. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, The other thing I was able to do with this platform is uh, I can, I can actually give you downloadable scripts. So any of the ones that I did in the course that are remotely difficult, I have uploaded the script so you can actually just install it and, and start with the endpoint, if that makes sense or build it yourself, whatever. I mean, I just wanted to make it as easy as possible for people to get rolling with this. Some of the ones like the, um, I have some um, document generation scripts that, you know, you make fancy word or pages documents and those probably make more sense just to download the starting point and then build from there. We all, I, I think I and David and you and all of our listeners, we all struggle with just the amount of email that we all get and the quality of that email. I I feel like sometimes looking for the email from my wife or from an advertiser or from a coworker, it's like digging through a haystack, trying to find the needle. And it's just so much stuff in there. And SaneBox just gets rid of that frustration for me because it learns what email is important to me and it filters out what isn't, saving me hours And SaneBox is agnostic in the best possible way because it works with all kinds of email programs and services. You're not locked to a special weird app on the iPad and maybe they don't have one for the Mac. No, no, no. You can use the mail client you want. You can use the mail service you want because SaneBox uh, works above that layer, works in the cloud. And we're talking about some incredibly great email filtering. So a couple of examples of some filters that SaneBox has, and you can set up others, but one being Sane Later. This is the one that I use the most. And so this is just looking for emails that comes in. And if it seems maybe not so important as something else, it goes in the Sane Later folder. And usually at the end of the day, I go through there and there's, you know, a handful of emails that, yeah, they're, they're not important. SaneBox has learned what I want, but they can just wait there until I'm ready to deal with them. They're not interrupting me. I will go to them. And then there's the same black hole. So some of those emails are from newsletters. You know, someone got my email address or they're from somebody I'm just not interested in hearing from anymore. And I can drag it from the same later folder or even the inbox to the same black hole. And that means I'm not going to hear from that person again. It's a great place to put annoying PR emails. I just put them right in there and they're gone for my life. You've got great snooze features as well. So you can defer 
uh, emails to the next business day or weekend. So I do this a lot on the weekends where I'm really trying to take uh, my Saturday and Sunday and not work. And if I get a work email that I know I need to deal with on Monday, I can put it in this in a snooze folder and know that I'm going to get it Monday morning when I step into my office. But Sandbox is more than filtering. You can do things like moving large attachments to Dropbox or other cloud services and a bunch of other features besides. Sandbox has various pricing plans that start as low as about $4 a month, and there's a 14-day free trial. Head on over to sandbox.com MPU, and you'll receive a $25 credit on any plan. My guess is during that 14-day free trial, you're going to know it's for you because two-thirds of MPU listeners who have tried Sandbox get subscribed, so I think you're going to love it. Once again, that's sandbox.com MPU to receive a $25 credit on any plan. Sandbox can help you stop drowning in email, and we'd like to thank them for supporting Mac Power users. I was really relying on Sandbox uh, as I was trying to get this this field guide done. <laughs> <laughs> I really needed email filters for a few weeks. Yeah, I know you really had the the hammer down there. So 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 let's get into it. Let's maybe go through some basics of the interface. Uh, so key, sure. Keyboard Maestro is a uh, kind of what you think of as a classic menu bar app. Uh, it has a couple of little I- a couple of icons. I use the one that looks like the command key. And it's just in the menu bar, but you can, of course, spawn the full editor from there. You can hide the doc icon. That's not there all the time unless the editor's open. So you have some some customization there. And it's broken down into a very traditional interface where you have uh, groups, you have your macros, and then you have the editor itself. Yeah, I always think of it as like the mail slash iTunes interface at least classic iTunes, you know, you've got far, you you know, you get more granular, the further right you go across in the application and, and they call them groups, you know, so you can group certain macros together. You can see the macros inside a group, and then you've got the place where you build the macros. Mm -hmm. You also have what I think is really clever edit, try and record buttons. So as you're building something, you can just try a little section of it without, without like going through the trigger. So if you're thinking of this might make more sense in a second, but if you have a, a, a macro that's say dependent on a, on a folder appearing on your desktop, you don't have to go to finder and like make the desktop folder appear to test it. You can just hit the try button. So it lets you work your way through it as you build your macro, um, which I think yeah. is, is really a nice feature. So you're not sort of stuck waiting for your trigger to happen. If it's, if it's time-based or folder-based or something. Yeah, and one of the things they've added in one of the more recent updates is the ability to customize those those group and macro names and icons as well. So you can really, you know, make it look like your own. Like I have a group of of keyboard meister scripts that work in Apple Mail and I'm using the Apple Mail icon for that group. So it's very visual for me when I go and I can find it easily. Yeah, it's it's a great way if you have a lot of these to to find them and it gives you some uh a little personalization too if you end up sharing them with somebody. You know, you could have an icon name on there that makes it easily recognizable to them as well. But but the real meat of Keyboard Maestro, like most automation apps, there's there's really two steps. You've got triggers and actions. So the idea of automation is something is going to happen, whether you initiate it or it happens on its own. Maybe it's the time of day, or maybe it's you hitting a keyboard a shortcut, or maybe it's even you clicking a button in the Keyboard Maestro menu bar, because you can actually trigger um, trigger scripts from the menu bar that way. Uh, but either way, you create a trigger of some sort. And then once the trigger is fired, then what's the action that results from that? That's kind of the paradigm of a lot of automation. But what makes Keyboard Maestro different is just the sheer number of different triggers and number of different actions. There's so much you can do with your Mac. Um, and there's so many ways that you can trigger it to happen. Yeah. So do we want to walk through some of these uh, trigger types? Yeah, let's start. Let's start with triggers. I think that makes sense. Um, Okay. The most common one, and the one I use, one of the ones I use most often, is the keyboard shortcut. You know, just hitting a shortcut on your keyboard. Um, You know, I I got the uh, Apple Extended Keyboard when I bought the iMac, and I've been using it because it's the same color as my iMac, and I spent all this money, so I feel like I have to use it, right? <laughs> and, and I thought, you know, because I traditionally I was a guy that liked the uh, the keyboard without the number yep, pad on that's it. That's how you I know, am. It made, it made the um, mouse pad just a little bit closer or the trackpad a little bit closer. But I haven't really 
been that hasn't really been a problem but where it's really paid off for me is i've got a whole number pad here full of extra keys that i've tied to keyboard maestro scripts so a lot of the ones i build are are keyboard triggered um, the other thing I did in the video was I went through Carabiner Elements, which is a third-party app you can download, and I showed you how to install it to set up what I refer to as the hyper key. I got that from Brett Terpstra. And so it, it converts the caps lock key into shift control command option. So it's, it's the equivalent, if I hold down the caps lock key, it's equivalent to hitting those four uh, modifier keys at once, which gives me a whole keyboard's worth of extra keyboard shortcuts. Yeah, that's really a clever app. And, and uh, when I was going through the the field guide, it made so much sense to use that to tie those things together because there are a limited number of keys and you're, you know, you have got to compete with system keyboard shortcuts and other things. And so kind of having, you're kind of creating a space for your keyboard maestro shortcuts off to the side on their own. Yeah, and you are never going to hit a conflict because there's no system shortcuts or app shortcuts that use four modifier keys. Mm -hmm. So it's just a great way. And I never use the caps lock key anyway. So yeah. it's a great use. On Chromebooks, it's actually replaced with a search button, which I think is great. <laughs> I mean, it makes sense. I mean, who, you know, really. But, they, but anyway, so keyboard shortcuts are one of the ways you can create a trigger. Another way you can do it is a key uh, a keyboard string, like if you type a series of letters in order, you know, kind of like a text expansion tool. Mm -hmm. But it's uh, I found that actually not as useful when I was testing it because you've got to be somewhere where you can type text. And I don't know, I think keyboard shortcuts make a lot more sense for keyboard maestro than the um, text string, but you can type a text string and it'll work. Yeah, so that that's the one that I'm using for for most of mine, but I, I do have one that's using the the time trigger. So you can you can tell keyboard maestro at a certain time and you can even say on certain days. So say you just want it during the week or just on weekends, then create let, uh, let these actions move forward. And so um it, it is a, a a powerful one I think if you want to have some what I sort of consider bumpers in the workday. So I know you've talked about I think on the Michael Hyatt episode, at the end of the day, you know, apps get shut off. Uh, he talked about it too. Yeah. Um, and I've got it for like a reminder at the end of the day, something I need to do is like, it just basically opens a giant text window and tells me to do something. It can be really simple like that. Or you could have it, hey, you know, every, uh, if you have like a 24 seven, you know, headless Mac mini or something, hey, every morning at 2 a.m. I need this computer to do something. Then you can set it up in here, and it, a keyboard maestro just keeps an eye on the time. When that time comes around, it'll automatically fire that action. Yeah, th there's really two categories of triggers, and we just talked about them both. The first one is what I'll say: human triggers. You know, a human has to hit a keyboard shortcut to make the the automation begin. But then there's fully automatic triggers, which is like one example is the time of day, and that's probably one of the most common examples. But they don't just give you time of day. You can set it to run periodically. If you're into cron scripts, it, it can run on cron dates. So uh, it goes really deep in terms of how detailed you can get. But I love the idea of automatic triggers. You know, the idea that my computer, whether I am sitting at my computer or whether I am at the beach boogie boarding, my computer is going to do something at this time. Mm -hmm. And that is that's awesome, you know, when you can put that together. Yeah, I mean, you can have it set up even, uh, it can even count downtime. So say, hey, every five minutes, quit TweetBot, you know, if, you, <laughs> if TweetBot's open. Yeah. Uh, so you can even do little yeah. tasks like that very easily with this functionality. It, kind of somewhere in the middle of this, there are a set of triggers that relate to your system actions. Like if you're going to put the system to sleep, wake it up, log in. Um, if it's been idle for so long, you can have all this stuff related to your max um awake state, I guess, for lack of a better term. Yeah. Uh, I've got one that opens a bunch of apps that log in uh, using this. So you can do that in user preferences, but that list gets junky quick. And uh, uh, so that that's one that I'm using every morning. And you can do the same thing, like when it goes to sleep. Like for me, one of the ones that is a problem is Skype. I always forget that I've loaded up Skype. I use it for a lot of my podcasts, but I don't use it for really much else. And there's nothing worse than leaving Skype in the background because then people start calling you mm -hmm. and you're not even in the same room and your computer starts ringing. It was even worse for a while when I had my computer in the bedroom. So anytime my computer goes to sleep, I just shut down Skype. I, I quit the application. So you, know, you just think about what are the things you want your computer to do when it starts up or what are the things you'd like it to do as it shuts down 
uh, you can improve upon whatever Apple's opinion is using this application. And when we talk about the actions later, that's when the penny drops for a lot of this stuff, because we're just talking about these are triggers. These are things that can start an action. We haven't even talked about the actions yet. Uh, you've got them also around or based on the wireless network you're attached to. And this used to be, I think, a bigger deal for portable Mac users where you could set up, yeah. I think you still can, different like network profiles based on the network you're on. And you could basically do the same thing here. So you could say, okay, when it, when my laptop joins the work wireless network, then you know, quit these apps, launch these apps, or open these folders, or do this thing. And uh, that is pretty clever because it's, it's, it's kind of an ad hoc way of doing location based actions. Yeah, I this is one of my favorite triggers. I uh, in fact there's if you even if you're not going to get the field guide, go to the learn.maxparky. There's a like a 20 or 30 minute sample there. And this is one of the ones I included in the sample. Um the co- what I call coffee shop Wi-Fi. And the if you're going to Starbucks or the library or whatever, you can tell it because you can have multiple triggers. So the way I wrote it is you know, if the Wi-Fi name contains Starbucks or Pete's or library, then you're going to do some actions. And in this case, what I have it do is I have it shut down a bunch of social media because I go to those places to work, you know, and open up my writing application, you know, kind of put me into monk mode for lack of a better word. Yeah, I think it's it's really clever. Yeah. And, and at location is great. If you're using a laptop going back and forth to work, uh, you can do the opposite of that. When you come home and it sees that you've connected to your home network, Make sure to shut down all the work apps and you know enjoy your life a little bit. <laughs> yeah, it's 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 pretty cool. Um, you've you've got them also for files and folders, so you could have it watching for specific files in a location or a folder to be created, even things removed, which is also kind of a clever way of looking at it. And this sort of I think is where Keyboard Maestro can overlap with Hazel a little bit, where. You know, Hazel can have a watch folder and as certain file types come in or files with certain names come in, it performs actions. So I think this is where the two meet a little bit for me. Yeah, I, I think, um, I, you know, I guess I should address that. I mean, so there's three apps that keep coming up in this conversation, a text expander, Hazel, and a keyboard maestro. Um, keyboard maestro can do most of the things the other two apps can do, but it's not as good at text expansion as text expander and it's not as good in my opinion at file management as hazel um if you really want to get serious about doing text expansion or file management i I just don't think it it really is going to ultimately make you as happy as those other dedicated apps were because in those cases you've got teams of people working on just that one feature um i i think like i remember when um when uh smile went to the to the subscription dr drang had originally tried to do it in all text uh, text expansion and keyboard master, but I think he eventually posted he went back um, to text expander because you know those tools are better at those things. And um, I know that's a little weird because one of them is occasionally a sponsor, but it's just the truth. You know they are they're kind of better at that. Like with with uh, file management, hey, the, just the way you create the rules in Hazel, the tagging, all the stuff it does, it's just a little more powerful for that. Mm-hmm. That that being said. Um, there are things that I think in terms of file manage that keyboard maestro is better for. Like if you want to have it watching a folder and creating a document, like if somebody drops a document in this folder, then it creates a, a, you know, a spreadsheet and numbers or something like that. That's where keyboard maestro gets better when it, you know, when it needs to act on a different application. Uh, but for general file management stuff, I, I tried to make some, and they just were really uh, kind of wonky and keyboard master. I wasn't happy with those, so I ended up just sticking with Hazel for that stuff. Yeah, I don't see myself moving what I have in Hazel over to this, but it, yeah. it it's all, it's about finding kind of where they overlap. And like you said, some of these apps are better yeah. than others. And just because they have overlap doesn't mean that it's silly to purchase two or three of them and run two or three of them, right? I, I don't feel like I'm yeah. uh, sort of being wasteful in my nerd setup and having multiple uh, like powerful utilities running in my menu bar. Yeah. Well, for me, the whole thing is about saving time. If I can save, you know, just minutes with each one, it, they pay for themselves, especially, you know, when you look at the power, the relative power of these apps. Mm-hmm. But but fi- it does have file and folder management. Somewhat related, it's got window management, too. We talked about that a bit earlier. 
but like it's got some cool ideas in terms of window management. It's got built-in scripts so you can place windows at very specific locations. Um, one of my favorites in the sample group is I came up with a whole series of window management scripts that are tied to keyboard shortcuts. And I windows just fly around my screen with those scripts. It, it can also watch for the foremost window and perform actions there. And, and that's one that I, I think out of all these triggers, I think that's the one that I get, I sort of scratch my head the most on. I'm not sure that I have any strong ideas around how that could be useful for me. Uh, and I was curious if you do, is that something that, that you look at is when and I change to this window, do this action? One of the ones I included with the, you know, the useful script section of the field guide, um, there's a section, because I, I do several sections explaining how all the tools work, and then I have a section where I just unload all my favorite scripts. And one of them is the the Twitter problem. You know, I open up the Twitter app, and it's easy to just start scrolling through mentions, and all of a sudden, I just spent 30 minutes in the Twitter app, and I just wanted to, you know, send out a link to a late, latest post or answer something. Um, so when Twitter, or in my case, TweetBot becomes the front most window. So that's the trigger. The trigger is, oh, hey, he just made TweetBot in front. And then as soon as that happens, Keyword Maestro starts a timer that runs for three minutes. And after three minutes, it, it hides the TweetBot app. You know, it just literally disappears as I'm looking at it. <laughs> and, um, and it's silly, right? But it works because... It happens to me all the time that I go in there and get myself distracted, mm -hmm. and uh, and then it just hides. It doesn't quit. You could quit it if you want. If you want to get more extreme, you have the option to hide it or quit it. I just hide the app, and it's like, oh yeah, it's like that little bit of cold water across the face. So yeah, you're here to work, buddy. <laughs> you know. So uh, so that's one I use with the uh, the window in front. Oh, that's good. I hadn't thought about that use, but it makes a lot of sense. Yeah, I mean, you could do a lot with it. Like maybe you've got certain windows that you want in certain locations all the time. Uh, you know, I talked about um, triggers to locate windows. So that's really an action is, is, you know, sizing and placing a window. But you could also have the trigger for it. Just that window goes in front. Like I almost always use logic and full screen. Uh, I don't mean full screen, um, you know, the Mac version of the thing where it takes over the screen, mm -hmm. but just it fills the screen. And uh, so I just put in one where if logic, you know, opens up, then just make it a full screen, you know, fill the screen with the application. And that's another one. But, you know, just once you the, the, once you get the vocabulary of these things, then you find all sorts of different ways to implement them in your daily life. A couple of more. And there are a lot more triggers in this. I think we sort of pulled out maybe the ones that are the most common for people, but you can have it watching for removing or plugging in certain USB devices. So if you have a camera you plug in, for instance, or, you know, a USB key that you copy files off a regular basis, uh, but also mounting and unmounting shared volumes. So if you have, yeah. again, we keep coming back to this like Mac mini home server. If I mount this, when that happens, do these things, uh, you know, things that you may not think as trigger uh, being triggers, but keyboard maestro is aware of what's happening on the system and can, can act accordingly. Yeah, even when you move your mouse in a certain gesture, so you can trigger it by moving your mouse in a you know counterclockwise mm -hmm. circle, if that's your thing. I mean, uh, application triggers are another one we didn't mention that I think are worth calling out. You know, whenever an application quits or opens or whatever, like when whenever I open, um, whenever I open Skype, then also automatically open Audio Hijack. You know, for me, that's those are two apps that I always use together, and I always start by opening Skype. So why should I have to manually go open Audio Hijack afterwards? The app, you know, Keyboard Maestro just looks, and if I've opened Skype, then Audio Hijack opens too. That's cool. Uh, so there are there are a lot more than that. You can add macros to the menu bar item, so they're they're handy there. There's palettes, which we're going to talk about later, um, but I think this is a pretty good sample of of triggers you can use in Keyboard Maestro. I feel good yeah, that we've hit the high points. <laughs> there's a lot. Yeah, the scary thing is we spent all that time on it and we didn't, we didn't, there's some that we didn't even mention. Yeah. So they, it goes on and on and on there. And they're, they're useful because again, you might not think this one makes sense for like what I'm doing now, but they, like you said, they can, they can create ideas. They can spark ideas. I think they have, they have definitely for me as I've, as I've moved through learning a, a lot more about this program. Text Expander 6.5 for Mac OS and 2.0 for Windows sports a new visual editor for snippets. 
The new editor makes it easier to see and edit snippet fill-ins, dates, and date math, and nested snippets, and more. So the thing I've always loved about Text Expander is the ability to create these fill-ins where it automatically places the date in, or you can write the name of the recipient of an email, or even just grab the contents of your clipboard. But it's always been a little nerdy, frankly, to add those things in, and it looked a little funny, and it wasn't obvious, you know, what you're doing. Well, they redid that entirely. If you haven't played with Text Expander lately, you need to check this out because I know they put a lot of effort in this and it really came out great. When you put in a fill-in snippet or a date snippet, it gives you a token that you can put right into the snippet. You can drag it around and customize it to make it work just the way you want. So you can insert words and phrases or forms, templates, and more with just a couple of key clicks everywhere you type. Take control of your time and productivity by letting Text Expander handle your repetitive typing tasks. Love telling everyone about Text Expander? Join their affiliate program to earn a little extra, and the show listeners get 20% off the first year. I really love Text Expander. I'm really happy with this new update. I know how hard they worked on it. Please go check it out. Visit textexpander.com slash podcast to learn more about Text Expander. And also check out some of the cool posts they have over on their website. They've got some stuff about uh, goal series, about organizing your smartphone apps. They've got one about organizing your digital photos. We'll put some links in the show notes on this stuff. Text Expander is a very powerful tool, and they were the original sponsor of the Mac Power Users. Uh, once again, thank you, Text Expander, for all of your support. Everybody head over to textexpander.com slash podcast and let them know you heard about it here on the Mac Power Users. <laughs> So we've talked about triggers. So these are things that start a macro, but let's talk about actions now. So these are the the actual things that are happening after a trigger is fired. So go back. I think the keyboard shortcut's the easiest one to talk yeah. to. So I hit my keyboard shortcut, and what happens after that all falls into this action category. Yeah, that's this is the fun part, man. You you've triggered it. Now what are you going to make happen? Yeah. Um, <laughs> you know, if you've out, if you've ever had like a uh, just a secret closet desire to become an app programmer. This is where you get to kind of play at that. Even though you don't have to do any code, there's all sorts of cool things you can do in terms of actions on your Mac. Uh, one of the most basic ones, I always for me, starts with the text actions. Because I remember back on the 8-bit computers when I was programming them as a kid, how amazed I was that I could write a program that would put something on my TV because that was my monitor back then. <laughs> it was my TV. But the uh, it was just cool, you know, and you can do that here. They can uh, make text actions where it gives you a little box. It, it tells you something on a screen or you can have notifications, you know, slide in from the right side of the screen. That really feels like you're an app developer when you have your notifications sliding in on your Mac. Um, but I, my favorite is the big screen notifications. You know, that one I was telling Michael Hyde about, the one that t you know, tells me to shut down my computer and plan the next day. Mm -hmm. It shuts all the apps, but then it, it puts it in huge letters across the screen. You can't miss it. It takes over the whole yeah, screen. Works. Yeah, that <laughs> That's works great. for me. <laughs> so, yeah. So, do you ever like jump back, fall out backwards out of your chair when that goes off? Like you're just, you're typing away and suddenly 400 yeah, point text tells you to quit your, quit your, your day. Your yelling at you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, but that's cool, man. I, I just like, uh, I like having that control. And it's a way for the computer to have basically an interface to me as part of these scripts. Even some of the scripts where the point of the script isn't to give me text, I will still have it give me text just to kind of um, get things rolling or let me know it's finished. Uh, you, ha you also have um, clipboard control. So uh, and this is like a whole topic we could dive into about what Keyboard Maestro can do with clipboards and even multiple clipboards. But you can send and receive information off a clipboard. You can park information on a secondary clipboard. You can format the stuff on a clipboard. I mean, it, this is like an endless well almost. Yeah, it, it actually took me a while to get my head around how Keyboard Maestro treats clipboards because, you know, traditionally clipboard is one thing. And then there's clipboard apps out there that will save a clipboard history. Keyboard Maestro does that too. In fact, one of the settings I recommend is you have it save the um, clipboard even between sessions. So if you shut your Mac down and start it back up again, it'll remember the clipboard from the day before, which is great. Um, but what really uh, brings it to a new level is you can also create custom clipboards so maybe I have a clipboard full of contract terms for legal contracts, you know, for my day job. Or if you're in sales, you have a list of clipboard 
uh, clipboards that you know contain product information about various products and then you can grab those at will with scripts and place them into a document so you can kind of auto generate things and um, or you know it, it's just the idea that the application has I don't know if there's a limit on it but I think I have about 20 clipboards so it's certainly more than 20 um, you could have this you know, extended number of clipboards that go beyond what you traditionally think of as the clipboard. What's a day-to-day use for you uh, in in having multiple clipboards? Like, what, what does that grant you? Another thing I did is I made a series of clipboards and um, I triggered them with the control key. So, you know, usually it's command C to copy and command V to paste. But I made like, I think it's like 10 just temporary clipboards and you trigger them, but to, so the trigger in Keyboard Maestro is Command C, and they all have. We're going to talk about palettes later, but basically you create a conflict. You have multiple scripts that have the same uh, keyboard shortcut. So if I hit Command C, it's a conflict because there's ten of them, and then it says, "Oh, you have ten clipboards, and each one is copying the the existing contents to a clipboard." And since I have 10 different clipboards attached to this, I can hit the numbers one through 10 and it'll save the um, contents to that clipboard. And then if I hit command, I'm sorry, if I hit control V, then that's a trigger in Keyboard Maestro to paste one of those clipboards and then you just pick which number you want. So if I'm working on something where I've got like five things I'm going to be repeatedly using, uh, I just did it the other day. I had when I was working on a legal thing and there were like three or four different complicated names involved, company names and people. And I had saved each one to a number in the in the various you know customized clipboards and I would selectively paste them where they belonged in the document. Does that make sense? It, it does. Uh, I use Alfred's clipboard history for similar uses, but it involves way too much back and forth. You know, you got to go down and find your old entry and copy it again. And that's one I think I'm going to lift from you because that seems like it's way more efficient than my current system. Well, they also have uh, the clipboard in Keyboard Maestro does that too. Yeah. And the thing I like about the clipboard history, I haven't looked at Alfred's recently, so I don't remember. I, they probably do this too. But with the Keyboard Maestro, when you paste out of that clipboard, you don't have to paste it in the same format that you copied it. So even though you copied okay. it rich text, you can paste it as plain text which is really useful. Gotcha. Yeah, that is cool. Because sometimes you end up with weird formatting or it doesn't want to go where you want to paste it. Uh, That's neat. And the way I handle that is there's a trigger. In fact, I did a video on this in the course. Um, You know, normally you hit command V to paste. If in my case, if you hit the caps lock plus V, which is that hyper key we talked about earlier, then that opens up the keyboard maestro clipboard which is much more powerful and that's where you can manage that stuff there's a little gear icon over each paste entry and that's where you can choose the format of the paste uh you got some other actions yeah what we talked about earlier you have media playback control so at every every 6 p.m you know uh play the final countdown as you walk out of the office (laughs) if you just want to go out in style you can do that i'm not saying i have that one set up but i'm also not saying i don't have it set up so just gonna have to leave that to the imagination. I would. I think that you've inspired me. I think I should have like Star Wars like blast at like five thirty a.m. as I'm getting started. Just That's good. I'm sure nobody <laughs> else in the house would care. Probably in your household, David, they wouldn't think twice about it. But like, oh yeah, Dad's doing something. It's just that weirdo again. That weirdo down the hall. We've got controlling applications, which you spoke a minute ago about when an app becomes active. This is sort of the the backside of that. So. You could have an app open, close, hide. You can switch between apps all in actions. So one, you know, you mentioned a second ago, but you could mimic an app like Quitter, uh, which our friend Marco Armit wrote to, which counts down inactive time and then closes an application. Uh, but you could build something like what you have where every 90 seconds TweetBot gets hidden. And that's uh, that's too bad for you if you were looking at TweetBot. So if you need that sort of discipline or you just want to tidy up, You can have a bunch of apps get hidden automatically. So one that I use, for instance, in Quitter, but I'm going to move to Keyboard Maestro, I have like things like Calendar and 1Password basically hide after 30 seconds. So those are apps that I look at and need on a very regular basis. But when I'm working, I just don't want to see them in the background. And so you can just use this action to, you know, say, count down a certain number of seconds and then hide those programs so they're not uh, junking up my screen. That's a great idea with 1Password because I constantly am opening the app, but then I always forget to close it. So yeah, so you could just have you could have a timer set up, and it it counts down, and after it becomes active, and then hide it. It could be a nice way to keep things tidy on your Mac. 
the funny thing with that tweet bot trigger, because I I've been using that for like a year and it's like my monkey brain has been trained now. I get into Tweetbot and I like I am all business, baby. I'm gonna get my message out because I know that like I'm you know, a fuse has been lit, you know. <laughs> that's great. Yeah. Yeah, that's really cool. Keyboard Maestro comes with a whole bunch of options for switching between apps and doing things building those into uh, into other action chains. So I switch to this app and do this. And it's all kind of a building block of controlling, a- not controlling things in applications, but sort of applications themselves on a more meta level. Yeah. It, you know, and just general system control is crazy. You can you know set many of the system settings, volume, whatnot on your Mac. Um, you The application, but the application combined with the system stuff really can make a difference. Uh, one of the things I, I did a couple videos on this is you can do within applications, not only open an application, you can pick menu bar settings um, in an application. And so if you've got an app that makes you go to the menu bar, they don't have keyboard shortcuts or whatever, you can do that with Keyboard Maestro. But what gets really powerful is when you start chaining them together, you know, go change the font size, then change the paragraph formatting, you know, whatever the list of things you want to do you can have the application actually go in and click all the boxes for you uh, if there's something that you do repeatedly inside an application. You know, the system gives you tools to create keyboard shortcuts for menu bar items that don't have keyboard shortcuts on their own, or you can even remap them. So when I have, when I use Safari is instead of quit being command Q, quit is command option Q. Cause I always like go to close a tab and then quit the browser, but that's only one at a time. So keyboard maestro again, is kind of above and beyond what the system gives you that you can link multiple, you know, these things together one after another. And this is where I want to talk about pauses because, you know, in some, some applications you can actually move faster than the application could keep up with. So take your example of, I've got some text in pages and I'm going to change this formatting and maybe pages needs a beat in between them. So you could have, you know, select a menu item, pause for one second, two seconds, and then move on to the next deal. And you say something really smart in the field guide of uh, if you're if you're running into issues with complex macros, uh, the pause action can really like save your bacon. It, it just may be that you're that it's moving too quickly. Um, but it can also help with like kind of silly things. So I talked about my launch apps at login macro that has I'm opening it now six or seven applications I want open when I log in. But I don't want to use them in just preferences. Just, I like them here being separate. But a problem I was having with this is I use iTunes. It's the only app I use like in true full screen mode where it has its own space and there's like no menu bar at the top. What I was running into is that iTunes would launch and then my Mac would be on that screen and not on my main desktop because all I have is two spaces, my main workspace and then iTunes one to the right. Yeah. And, and so what I did is I have, A, I have iTunes opening first in this macro and then I say, wait four seconds. That gives iTunes enough time to open. You know, iTunes is it's kind of like an old man. It needs some time to get up <laughs> yeah, in the morning. Exactly. Uh, bones are creaking. Things are hurting. It counts to four seconds. And then it launches. Next, I have one password. And so one password opens on my main work screen. And it, it slides back into the space that I want to be in. So it can be a great way if you're running into timing issues or, or order of operations issues. The pause can be a lifesaver, I think. Yeah, if there's a drinking game out of this new field guide, it's every time I use the word pause because <laughs> uh, so often, I mean, I first I gave it its own video because, you know, that constantly I discovered as I was learning Keyboard Maestro that, you know, if there's ever a problem, it's probably the result of not pausing. And um, and the pauses quite often that I recommend are like 0.3 seconds. They're, you don't even realize there's a pause, but that's just enough time for the computer to catch up. Yeah, it's it's great. You you think about you know computer being so fast and so powerful, you can outrun it with keyboard maestro. You definitely can. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, pauses are great. Um, and and it, it is the it is the solution to scripts that aren't behaving, especially complicated ones that have multiple steps. Mm-hmm. I mean, you also use them as a timer. You know, you can like I talked about earlier with the tweetbot script. I'm use the you know I think the intention for that creation of that pause was say, okay, I want to have the computer wait, you know, uh, um, 180 seconds before it shuts TweetBot down. But it's also just really useful in between little steps. 
Um, uh, another thing that we haven't talked about that is really powerful, you know, getting back to the idea, you know, you want to be a programmer and you want to make your computer work for you is the user input action. Um, it's a very powerful tool where you can just basically put up a list of questions on the screen and answer them. And then it saves those as variables that you can use in other places. And, uh, I find all sorts of uses for that user input. It is cool because it, it gives you sort of programming tools you can set uh, variables and values and stuff, but in a way that I think is really approachable. I think in other automation systems, it's less approachable to understand this. And it's not as good as, as shortcuts. I think shortcuts is the best job of this yeah. as far as like I have a variable, move that variable over here. But you can totally work your way through it with Keyboard Maestro, basically feed information to the computer or to the macro and then have it do things with that information. I just wrote down for the 1.1 update, I'm going to do one with a Pomodoro, make your own Pomodoro timer. And then, oh, that's good. So you can use a user input to say, well, how many minutes, you know, or maybe select from a list, you know, 15, 30, whatever. And then it'll turn that into a variable and then run a pause command uh, to set the Pomodoro off. Yeah, that'll be fun. And it's not a difficult one. If you're listening and you're doing it, you can go ahead and post a script to the forum. That'd be great too. (laughs) Mm-hmm. <laughs> but it's not, it's these aren't that difficult, and uh, that'd be a good example of a use for that. There's a lot you can do with this application. I guess we keep saying that. <laughs> it, it goes on and on. There, there are a couple of like tricks that I want to talk to you about uh, while we're in the world of actions. And again, there are countless more actions than what we have touched on. We, we didn't even get into things like browser controls. So you can deal with tabs and URLs and site searches. It's endless yeah. almost. Yeah. But a thing that you brought up in the field guide I think is really important is the concept of notes. So can you walk us through what that looks like in Keyboard Maestro and some use cases for it? Uh, Do you mean like comments? Yes, comments. Yeah. So comments are things you can put into your script. And, you know, it's it's the old, if you ever listen to programmers talk, the problem isn't the you of today, it's you of tomorrow. You know, as you're making the script, you know exactly what you're doing. But if you come back to make changes to it in six months, you'll forget what it's about. They have a field you can drop in what they call a comment field. And you can even color code them and say, okay, this next set of steps is going to open the file for me, or this next set of steps is going to tag the file or whatever it's going to do. And then you can kind of give future you a little bit of a hint as to what's going on. Um, Like when I did, I did a series on uh, auto generating documents. I mentioned it earlier. I've got a bunch of comments in there for each variable that's getting replaced. So when I want to go back later, I can change or remove variables. I can find exactly where they are in the script. Shortcuts has this similar feature. And of course, like if you're programming in a text editor with programming languages, like it's in there too. But if you're building complex things or something that you maybe isn't even all that complex, but you're, you're afraid that you may forget what's in there. Comment is an excellent way to leave a, a bread breadcrumb trail to future you. Well, one thing that um, Keyboard Maestro definitely does better than Siri shortcuts, and I hope this isn't true for long, I hope that in June that this gets fixed, is with Keyboard Maestro, once you have a set of scripts or a a portion of a script, if you want to use it again, you can select it, copy and paste it, you know, Command-C, Command-V, and you can duplicate sections of your script if you want to run them more than once. Uh, I hate how in Siri shortcuts it doesn't do that. You know, just just as a side, so we haven't said anything about iOS the whole show. If you're still listening and you have an iOS device, the way to get around that is to make subroutine shortcuts. So, like, just make a, a – if there's a section that you're going to use over and over again, just save that. And then in Siri shortcuts, you can have a step that says run a shortcut. Mm-hmm. So you just have it essentially – one step to rerun the shortcut over and over again. And you can build, you know, with multiple pieces. That, that's very hard to explain audibly. But. Yeah, it's a, uh, some of this is tricky. You yeah. know, it's a, yeah. it's a visual thing. But another thing you can do that is is cool and, uh, and I think unique to Keyboard Maestro and, and talking about these other types of applications is, so you can add notifications. So, so I think a lot of people would add a notification to the end of a macro, you know, goes up in in the top right part of the Mac screen and say, hey, your, your macro completed. But you had a tip, and I'm going to spoil the tip, so I'm sorry, but you can insert those at any point into a macro. So if you're having something that's failing or something that is complex and you just want to keep an eye on, you can have a notification that says, hey, I've made it to this step or I've made it this far. And it can be like a, a flag that goes up as your macro is running. I thought that was clever. 
Yeah, well, and, and we'll talk about that a little bit later because they even have debugging tools, which can do the same thing. But no matter how you want to fix that problem, there's a way to do it. There's also a group of favorites. It's another thing that I think when you're doing the actions is just collect the ones you use repeatedly into the favorites. Because one of the problems, just like I said at the beginning of the show, there's just so many available actions. If you look at all the available actions, you get lost in the list. So if you're doing something that's going to be using the same set of actions over and over again, like for me, the pause is always in my favorites because I'm always grabbing a pause for something or another Just save it to the favorites and you're good. So that's that's a, a brief look at actions. Again, you can you can build a macro with a bunch of these actions chained together, and there's a lot more that we didn't get into. But I think that's a good it's a good sampling of of what's in there. Yeah, I need to tell you a story about past Stephen because past Stephen was not not as wise as he is now. And in college, I had a a power book, 15 inch aluminum power book G4 that unfortunately sustained some water damage, and I lost some data. Some of it was backed up at work on another drive, but not everything was. And I know that I've got files and more importantly to me, photos that went down with that laptop. And it's something that I I decided right then and there that wasn't going to happen to me again. And now it's easier than ever to stay safe with something like Backblaze. It is an unlimited cloud backup for Macs and PCs. And it starts at just $6 a month. And had I had something like Backblaze running, I would have had those files, Um, but I didn't, so I don't. Backblaze is really easy to get started with. You're going to head over to the website. You can sign up for a 15-day free trial, and that's at backblaze.com slash MPU. It's a Mac app. It runs in your menu bar, and uh, it has a bunch of preferences, so you can tell it, hey, you know, exclude this folder or this type of download. You can set things like backup speed and a bunch of other uh, tools as well. You can even set it to back up external hard drives, which is huge if you're like me and running a couple external drives. I know that the data on those are safe and sound, uh, just like my internal drive. Backblaze backs up documents, music, photos, videos, drawings, projects, everything that's important to you. But it's not locked away in the cloud forever. If you need to restore, it's super easy to log into the website and initiate a restore. But say that you're on the go, and you just need a couple of files. Maybe you left a Word document on your desktop and it's not synced anywhere to the cloud, but you need it and you're on the road. Or you can log in with their mobile app on your phone or iPad and access all of your data. So you could download just that app on the go, uh, keeping your files accessible to you. So avoid a looming data disaster. Go to backblaze.com slash MPU for your unrestricted free trial and let them know you heard about them on Mac Power Users. So head on over again to backblaze.com slash MPU. Head over there for that free trial. My thanks to Backblaze for saving me from countless day disasters now and for their support of this show and Relay FM. So tell me about Palettes. So this seems like yeah. a, a crazy, powerful system. Yeah. So Palette, uh, it's one of the secret sauce pieces of Keyboard Maestro, in my opinion. We've been talking a lot about, you know, all these triggers and how do you make your scripts go off? And as you start using the application, you start to use it for a lot more things. Like one of the screencasts I have is all the scripts I've been building for Ulysses because I have been using Ulysses increasingly for almost everything. So every time there's something about the app I don't like, I just write a script to fix it. But I don't want to remember separate keyboard shortcut for each one of those scripts. So I have a palette and it's the way I trigger it is the caps lock plus the U key. And when it does that, it drops a little menu on the screen and it's got a list of all of the scripts that I've written for Ulysses. And then I can just tap the letter to the corresponding script, you know, the first letter and it'll fire off that script. So I don't have to make separate triggers. I don't have to remember, you know, three is for, you know, the uh, importing an, an Apple note and four is for, you know, adding markdown. You know, they're just all in a list for me, a nice little menu you can choose from. And I've made these for a bunch of things on my Mac. I have them for Safari. I have them for text um, modification. You know, so I can take the contents of the clipboard, make it all caps or lowercase or whatever, and that's just on caps lock T for me, and I can choose from a menu. So these these palettes, and you have to kind of watch the video to understand it, but they're super powerful. And the thing about it is it makes it really easy to put all that Keyboard Maestro script you've been writing into effect very easily because you don't have to stop and think about, you know, how do I trigger this? 
it also works in your favor for preserving the number of keyboard shortcuts. Not only you have to remember, but that are available. And if you've got a bunch of these macros, palettes can be a way to sort of group like jobs together. Yeah. So one of the things you can do with a group of, of keyboard master scripts is you can say, this group only works in a certain application. Like the earlier example, I've got a, a group for just Ulysses. And then another thing is you can create a script and I show you how in the video you can create a, so create a custom palette based on that group. So I hit, you know, caps lock U, and then it gives me that. And if I add new scripts to it in the future, they get automatically added to the palette. I don't have to even think about it. And um, that's, that's the way I primarily like to use palettes. And once you understand that, it really kind of opens up the options for you in terms of making sure you use Keyboard Maestro scripts more often. In addition, they have other palettes. They have their own palette for the application, which is something you can, it's, it's actually a trigger. Like we were talking about one of the triggers we left off earlier is you can say a trigger is I'm going to add this script to the palette. So whenever the palette drops down, I can select from that. Um, and then they have what I mentioned earlier when I was talking about the uh, clipboard as a conflict palette. If you ever make two scripts that have the same trigger, then it's going to give you a conflict palette. It says, oh, you've got two or three here that have the same trigger. Which one do you want? And um, that you can intentionally use, like what I did with that copy and paste trigger I talked about earlier. But yeah, palettes are, you know, th this is one you almost need to watch a video to understand. But once you kind of grok it, it's really powerful. I, I'm curious, did you pick up on that palette stuff as you were going through the course? Uh, I did. And I, I think the one that really, the Groot palette thing, I think makes makes sense. I think it's one of those features that I'm not sure I've got a plan for yet. But I absolutely love the inclusion of the conflict palette. Again, yeah. if you have a bunch of these or or like like you mentioned earlier with your clipboard stuff, you can intentionally create conflicts to uh, surface this palette when when and where you need it. And I think that's cool because it gets it gets keyboard maestro out of its own window and and gives it another layer of interface wherever you are. And I think that's a pretty powerful tool. Yeah. And, and to me, that is the way I trigger a lot of scripts between these palettes. I mean, I do use keyboard shortcuts as well, but uh, when I'm really like on an app specific group of macros, I like to use the palettes. Some other kind of advanced techniques is there, there are, we talked earlier about a debugger. It has a debugger in it and there's a video on it. So there's different ways you can set it up where it goes by step and it tells you, hey, I just completed this step. I'm about to start the next step. And you literally step through the script to find out if something's breaking. Um, and you can also have it just running in the background, you know, logging. So if there's a problem, um, if, as you get into advanced scripts, you may want to do that. And there's a full host of programming tools um, and I'm, I'm not talking about like, we're going to do Xcode with APIs, but just like, you know, if then loops and, you know, the, the basic programming ideas are there. So you can include those into scripts as well. So, you know, you can go pretty far down with Keyboard Maestro down the road if you, uh, if you want to use that stuff. Uh, in your experience and in, in building the, all this out, how often do people need to expect that they're going to need to debug stuff. I mean, that sort of is a scary programmery word, but in my experience, at least I haven't had to do anything. Is that something that people should, should fear or is it sort of there if you need it, but it's not going to be in your way? Yeah. I think more of the second, I mean, all the stuff I wrote in this field guide, there's very little scripting or like heavy duty programming stuff. There's a couple, but honestly, if you want to do scripting, this wouldn't be a four hour course. It'd be like a 20 hour course. Cause you gotta learn right. how to script. But the, um, uh, so the stuff I do in this course, I get a lot done with Keyboard Maestro, and I use almost none of the advanced stuff, to be honest with you, because, you know, the problems I have to solve often are workflow related. You know, I want to get my work done faster, and being able to select menu items and set windows up and do stuff like that is is the extent of the power I need. It's definitely not something that should keep people off of checking out this app. No, no, just yeah, give it a try. You'll find. I mean, it, it's so much that you can do without ever touching that stuff. And and one of the things I mentioned in the course is there's a great resource uh, over at the Keyboard Maestro um, forums of people that are writing scripts. So if you want a specific script, you can often go over there and find it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's it's a really great community of nerds. Yeah, and I think and I think it that really speaks to how long and and how long this app has been around, but also how dedicated 
its developer and user base are. Like this is not true for a lot of Mac apps where they have a robust community around them, but it's definitely true here. Oh yeah, definitely. It's cool. Uh, and they use uh, discourse. So thumbs up from us as, yeah. as fellow discourse administrators. <laughs> it's, it's funny how discourse has taken over. It's everywhere. It's everywhere. Um, uh, so that's, that's the palette stuff that's programming and debugging. Um, let's talk uh, maybe about some of our uh, favorite examples of things. Uh, I've been waiting for this part, man. <laughs> I, I know. And I know, I know we could go long here. So I, I want to limit you to maybe, maybe three or four just uh, cool things you're doing in Keyboard Maestro that uh, you want to share. Ah, you're making me pick. Um, I know. Well, I, I've been teasing um, throughout the video or this podcast, this um, auto document generation one. For me, for the longest time, I was trying to figure out the best way to auto generate documents. Because as a lawyer, a lot of times you do have form documents you at least start with. You know, they, there are apps on Windows that are pretty good for this. There aren't really very good apps for this on Mac. And I always thought, well, I'll just automate it. And I for I, I wrote Apple scripts to do this. I did I did all these different things to try and automate this document generation. What I'm talking about is you've got a a specimen document either in Microsoft Word or or in Pages, and you want to open the document, save a copy of it with you know the name of what you're you're creating and then go and do a bunch of search and replaces in it and that sounds like it should be easy but it actually isn't keyboard maestro just nails this thing it nails it really well so i've got these uh, palette i can just push a button on and then it just starts flying it pulls documents it makes copies of them some of the ones i do create like 10 documents uh, with a common set of data, you know, puts up a wow. user interface, asks you the names, you know, number of shares or whatever, you know, things you do as a lawyer. And then it, it starts, that's the starting point. And I have the starting point of my documents done very quickly. That's one of my favorites. Yeah, that's awesome. And I'd imagine it in your line of work, hugely helpful. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not spending up a lot of documents, but I know that's not true for you. <laughs> and then um, like Microsoft Word, you can do it. It took me a while to crack Microsoft Word because uh, Microsoft Word does this thing where it opens up a modal dialogue, which kind of brings the whole thing to a screeching halt. But I, I figured it out. And I, it's all in the video. So if you watch them and I, I gave I gave I made simpler ones, but they have all the tools in them and you can download them and, and build your own from there. But that that was a lot of fun. I figured that out about a year ago and that was a game changer for me. I bet. Some of them, but some of them aren't that complicated. There's, there's simple ones too, you know, like, um, there's a thing in Ulysses where in order to duplicate a, uh, a, a pro I think they call it, they don't call it projects, but it's basically the project level in Ulysses where you've got a bunch of subfolders and you want to duplicate mm -hmm. it. There's no keyboard shortcut for it. In order to do it, you've got to right click on it and then you've got to select duplicate and then click it. It's just a, a, a very mouse intensive thing. So I just made a little script that uses this really cool trick we didn't talk about earlier. You can have Keyboard Maestro click. First, you can take a picture of something on the screen, you know, with a key, with a um, with a screenshot. You know, what is it Command Shift Four, and then you just draw a little you know rectangle around something on the screen, and then you put that in Keyboard Maestro, and you say wherever this is on the screen, go and click on that. Mm -hmm. with the mouse. I mean, that's crazy, right? So, uh, but so what I do is I have a thing called template client in, in, um, Ulysses. It's just in the menu, in the list of different folders on the left column. It just, so it looks at the whole screen and finds that it clicks on that. It right clicks on that. Then it drags down and finds duplicate and clicks on that and duplicates it. It's just a silly little mouse interaction. But every time I did it, it made me mad at Ulysses. Like, why am I having to do this with my mouse, right? <laughs> you know? Now all I do is I hit caps lock U, and that's one of my selections is to duplicate that client folder. And I press a button, and it happens. What's cool about that, um, it, it's extremely powerful because what it does is it unlocks applications and parts of the system to automation that wouldn't be accessible to you otherwise, so yeah. a lot of apps and services don't have hooks into something like Keyboard Maestro, but because it can visually recognize things, and you can even do things like move the cursor to this point and then click, you can do all these sort of visual things, kind of acts like a little, like a robot user on your computer. And so what you're really doing is you're just speeding up what you would do as a person, but letting Keyboard Maestro do it. And the power of that, and it is hard to explain, but the power of that 
is really unending because it means that you can basically loop in almost anything on your Mac to Keyboard Maestro because it can act like a human user. That's incre- I mean, that's incredible. That is incredibly powerful. Yeah, and, and the idea that it all starts with me taking a picture of what I wanted to press. So, you know, the problem would be you could always tell it, click on these coordinates on the screen, but the window's never going to be in the same place. So that's not going to solve the problem. So you, literally you take a picture of what you wanted to click and, and Keyboard Maestro scans the screen and finds that and clicks that. <laughs> it's, it's, so, <laughs> it's ridiculous. It's so <laughs> no, good. Right? Makes me happy just thinking about it. But mm-hmm. the, uh, another one I did is uh, I talked about window management earlier, but what I didn't talk about is setups. And um, I have a palette of setups. You know, if I hit caps lock S, it gives me all my setups. So if I want to record Mac power users and I just hit M for MPU, it will, it does this whole thing for me. It opens up all of the apps that I use to record the show. It opens up Safari to the page where we keep our, um, our sponsor notes. It opens up, you know, also to the Google shared folder where we keep our outline. So it like, it sets up the whole system for me to get started recording a show. And actually before it does that, it hides everything else. So I've got, when I want to switch to Mac power users mode, I hit command S M and then everything happens. Um, I have like a legal work setup where I put, you know, all the stuff on my reference monitor, that little monitor to the right, mm-hmm. the bottom half of it. I load like five apps into there every morning and I don't see them all, but if I just swipe up, I can pick from them. And then on my big iMac screen, I've got, you know, my, my legal research program or my, my word process or whatever I need to work on. I've got there, but I've got everything I need referenced on the right side of the screen. And the, those setup scripts are basically a combination of one thing. First, they, first thing they do is they, they hide everything. So they clear the screen, you know, they clear the decks and then they open up the apps that I want and they use all those window macros to put them in the places I want them. But not only can I open the apps, I can do more, you know, I can, go into Safari and go to a specific URL like I do with the Mac Power Users one. Or I can go into OmniFocus and I can type keystrokes in OmniFocus that trigger my custom perspectives for my work. So I can just, like with a touch of a button, I can have my computer reconfigure itself for whatever I'm going to work on. And that's real powerful. We spoke about my daily log in our day one episode, how I sometimes I do it in a notebook. I have a text expander snippet that lays it all out in day one. Uh, but I, I thought I could recreate this with the user input actions. And so... I have it running at 6 p.m. Monday through Friday, or I also have it assigned to a hotkey if I want to run it outside of that schedule. It gives me a a pop-up window where I can enter the journal entry, which is a couple sentences about the day, three completed tasks, one bad thing, one good thing. And uh, my only complaint with this is that the the text entry and the user input is just a single line. So if you type, you know, a paragraph, it horizontally scrolls and I could get around that by using building like an HTML form, but that's overkill for what I need. So I'm kind of living with this. Yeah. I hit OK on the pop-up window and it gives me a uh, a new window with the text that I entered with headers, with the date. It puts the three completed tasks in an, an outline format. Uh, so I see it, but it also copies all of that to my clipboard. So then I can go and paste it in to day one uh, directly and it's it's been kind of fun the last couple of weeks, you know, as we've been preparing for this. That at six p.m., you know, I have do tell me uh, on my iPhone, hey, you know, complete your daily log. But if I'm at my Mac, I can just fire it off real quick. And there are still days where I'm going to hit cancel and do it in my notebook because I just prefer it that day for whatever reason. Uh, but it was kind of a fun way to get into the variables. And so I have uh, a a zip of that in the show notes if people want to uh, to download that and check it out, even if you don't want to use it. I think it's a simple enough example of how the variables and values work to kind of let you see uh, what that system is like. So that's, you know, a little programming. It may be a little confusing, but I think it's simple enough you could follow it pretty easily. Yeah, I have a similar one in the um, section six of the field guide where it's meeting notes and you press a button and it, it prompts you for a couple questions and then it opens up a document and puts in, you know, the date, the time, the the subject, the attendees, mm-hmm. and then it puts space for you to write. You actually do the writing in the word processor or text editor, wherever you, you run the script. But then it also adds a list of action items at the bottom. It's just like all the stuff that you would norm, normally uh-huh. add, it does for you automatically. But then the cool part is then there's a second script that you run at the end of the meeting, and it grabs the file 
and emails it off to everybody that was at the meeting. And that's cool. So you can automate that process. Um, you know, so you can send basically the notes out to everyone, especially if you've got action items on the bottom. It's really up to your own creativity. I, one of the things that I am really looking forward to with the release of this is just hearing back from people with the cool scripts they make, because it's, it seems like an unlimited number of things you can do once you start figuring out all these tools. If people get into this, uh, please share them in the forum, because it's again, it's one of those things where someone may not create exactly what I need, but it may be enough to tweak to meet my needs or spark an idea for somebody else. It's a very sort of collaborative thing, I think, working in Keyboard Maestro. Yeah, and I'm not going. To, we, you know, we're we're running out of time for the segment, but I have stuff in there that's really cool. Like when you plug in your camera card, setting it up for camera card import, or when you plug in your scanner, setting it up for scanning. Mm-hmm. There's yep. all kinds I of straight this up, other so stuff. I straight up just downloaded those and are using them. <laughs> like, it's <Yeah>. great. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's uh, what they're there for. As is. Yeah. yeah. Cool. Yeah. I want to talk to you a little bit about some of the uh, some of the production stuff behind this um, after this break. This episode of the Mac Power Users is brought to you by Squarespace. Make your next move with Squarespace. Squarespace lets you easily create a website for your next idea with a unique domain, award-winning templates, and more. Maybe you want to create an online store, or maybe you want to create a portfolio. Maybe you want to create a blog. It doesn't matter. You can do all that stuff with Squarespace. It's an all-in-one platform that lets you do just that. There's nothing to install, no patches to worry about, no upgrades needed. You don't have to worry about any of that stuff. Squarespace has got it covered. They have award-winning 24-7 customer support if you need any help, and they let you quickly and easily grab a unique domain name. And all of those award-winning templates are beautifully designed for you to show off your great ideas. I have a success story with Squarespace. I had a, a friend recently that, well, it was actually over a year ago that wanted to set up a business and she needed a website. And she remembered what it used to be like to set up a website where you had to you know, pay somebody thousands of dollars and you know, deal with all that nonsense. So I told her I'd help her out with Squarespace. And the thing for me with Squarespace is I like helping friends with it because they can learn it. And once they learn it, I don't have to do it for them. You know what I'm thinking, right? Oh, well, yeah. either, either way. So oh, she, yeah. <laughs> uh, she, um, she came over the other day totally unrelated just to visit and she uh right in front of my kids said you know your dad is great he set up my website and i love it and i use it every day and that just made me feel really good um knowing that i could help a friend out uh with and you know squarespace does all the work for me basically once i taught her how to use it but she's got an amazing website and she updates it every day and uh she is one of the things she's really happy with so i, I was glad to play a small role but really squarespace did all the work Squarespace plans start at just $12 a month, but you can start a trial with no credit card required by going to squarespace.com slash MPU. And when you decide to sign up, use the offer code MPU to get 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain and to show your support for the Mac Power users. Once again, that's squarespace.com slash MPU and the code MPU to get 10% off your first purchase. We thank Squarespace for the support of this show and all of Relay FM. Squarespace, make your next move, make your next website. So quickly before we wrap up, I, I want to hear about uh, some of the stuff that goes into this. I know this is uh, one where you've had other people helping and I've, I've, you've let me kind of behind the curtain a little bit seeing this come together. Uh, so why don't you share a little bit of, of that? Yeah, I was, I was really happy with the way production rolled on this one because this was a hard one to put together. And, you know, traditionally I did these almost all by myself and I moved to the video model a couple of years ago, you know, as I set up the learn.maxsparky site with each one, I'm, you know, I'm learning more and I feel like I'm really kind of getting to a high level with this stuff and I'm really happy with it. Um, the, the process for me, like I, I started outlining this in my node years ago, this course. And so every time I use keyboard maestro, I'd write down some notes and some ideas. Uh, but late last year, I decided I really wanted to get this one done. So I, I really started focusing on it. So my node was kind of the the working point for me. But then I just started putting things together. What I did differently here um, was I got uh, some help involved with some of the editing. You know, recording screencasts is hard, editing them is also hard. Mm-hmm. But I, I got somebody to help me. We did it with uh, because I have this account with, um, you know, Basecamp. You're just anyone you can fit into that, you will do it. Oh, I spent the money on it, right? <laughs> I guess so. Yeah. Basecamp is a great place to put files and share information and tasks. And oh, absolutely. There are a lot of big files. So we, uh, we were using that to its full extent. The other thing I did is I've really come to appreciate Airtable. 
We talk about that over on the Automators podcast quite a bit. It's a online database slash spreadsheet application. Um, but when you've got multiple people working together, it is really helpful. In fact, we've got um, just, I think just a few days before this show comes out, oh, we're doing a show on Airtable over on Automators. I'd recommend checking that out. But it, the great thing is I had, you know, three or four people helping me out on different pieces of this. But we had a full Airtable database of each video and we could see exactly where the status was, you know, uh, you know, initial recording, initial edits, you know, changes to edits, voiceovers, all the different things you go through in the production schedule down to, you know, the final uploading of closed captions and completion or uploading of additional documents. And with Airtable, you can have it sort. It's kind of like a pivot table in Airtable where you can say, show me everything that is attached to me or attached to this task that I'm responsible for. So uh, throughout the process of having multiple people work on it, everybody knew exactly what everybody else was doing. And that was great. And I think it, it provides for a better final product. I'm so happy to hear that you are bringing other people into this. I mean, it, it makes such a huge difference in projects just with this scope that you can know that you can trust other people with with part of it. And with something so complex, it means that you're less likely to drop the ball on any one part of it. If you have multiple people looking at it and responsible for parts of it. And I think it shows in this, I mean, this is, this is an excellent field guide. And uh, I think that for me, I learned so much through it. I'm glad I was able to go through it early. And I think that your new system for creating these, I hope it pays dividends for you. And I hope that you can continue to uh, crank these things out. Well, I, you know, I only make the ones that I feel like I have to get out of my system. And this one, I definitely had to get out of my system. <laughs> yeah. But it came out great. I, I understand that. It came out great. And um, I'm really happy with it. I, I, I really enjoy hearing about people that pick these things up and get better at something because of it. So if you do, let me know. I, lo I love hearing those stories. And uh, yeah, I just, I, I'm in the post-launch glow right now, you know? <laughs> Because yeah. I've been so focused on this for so long. It's nice to step back now and share it with the world. Yeah. I mean, this has been in our outline for a long time, <laughs> knowing yeah. this was coming. So yeah. uh, congratulations and uh, everyone listening, go check it out. It's uh, it's a really spectacular way to learn about so much power just waiting for you on your Mac. It's just lurking there below the surface for you to come find. Yes. Yeah, thank you. All right, we're the Mac Power Users. You can find us over at relay.fm slash MPU. Um, uh, thanks to our sponsors today. That's our friends over at SaneBox, Smile, Backblaze, and Squarespace. And we'll see you next week.